Hi, viewers. Welcome to another Journeys with Jeff episode. Uh, we have a real treat for you. I think you're going to agree. Uh, there are many people out there who may be familiar with Mims Butterworth, uh, who is a longtime uh, activist, and um, she has uh, agreed to do two shows. We did two 30-minute shows with her. Um, she has a Forrest Gump tendency to be in the right place at the right time in history. Uh, beginning with 1938 Nazi Germany, she was there. And she has some fascinating stories to share about her experiences and uh, about the having tea with Eleanor Roosevelt and all the way up through the years. Those are just two examples. Uh, for those of you who live in West Hartford or are watching this on TV, we spring this on YouTube. So if you have friends and relatives, they've got to watch this show. It's wonderful. YouTube, Journeys with Jeff, WHC-TV. Have them check it out on uh, YouTube and uh, if they live anywhere outside of West Hartford. So enjoy. And uh, there's two shows, and uh, we will see you at the end of this one. Thank you. Here with Mims Butterworth. Um, my name is Jeff Grandy. I'm going to ask Mims some, some questions. It's nice to be with you today. Um, Mims, first, first, just first off, what was it in your environment and your experiences uh, that made you become politically active? Well, I was taught by some women who had been suffragettes. That may have had some influence on me at Chafee School. And they were also members of the League of Women Voters. And so they were very interested in politics. And the history teacher, one of them took me down, took our class, which was very small, uh, to the legislature once to listen to a debate on child labor law, laws, and so I got involved very early that way. When, when were you born? Uh, two years before women got the vote. So that was 1918? 1918. Wow, and you were born in, uh, what's your hometown? Well, I was born in the Hartford, but soon lived in Windsor. So much of my life, oh my, before I was married, was in Windsor. And what, what is it that brought you to, to Chafee School? How did you get to go well, to Chafee? Well, in those days, I don't know if it's still true, the, law, the will of the Loomis family and the Chafee family was to start a school for boys and girls. And so they had all the money from that will to start. And so, but the part of the will was for Chafee and Loomis people from Windsor would have tuition free. And so uh, I was the benefit of that as we all were from Windsor. And you voted, the first time you voted was 1940. Yes, uh, well, 21. Well, tell us about that first election. Why, and how did you vote? Who did you vote for in 1940? Uh, Roosevelt, and, uh, FTR. Why, well, I voted, why did you vote for Roosevelt? Well, our family had suffered from the Depression. And, and my father was out of work. Uh, and. Uh, I knew a lot about people out of work and the problems we were having and the, the action that Roosevelt had taken up to that time were the ones that seemed to me to be best for our family and people who were out of work. And uh, so it was simple to in my mind uh, that that's who I should vote for. What did your father do? What was his Occupation. He had been a minister, but he had ch changed to become personal director at Sage Allen's. But then he'd been persuaded by my uncle to go into business for himself as a real estate. And so uh, 
he was uh, did that just as the stock market fell, which meant, of course, that he never had any <laughs> any uh, people that bought either insurance or whatever he was selling, and so and he wasn't a salesman anyway, so he lost his job. How many people in your, how many brothers and sisters? How large is your family? I had one older brother. And and uh, so when you were young, those earlier years, uh, life was difficult in terms of uh, finances and expenses. Yes. On the other hand, it seemed to me we were the lucky ones because we had had enough years of confidence so that the first few years of our growing up, we had a, a stability. And so, it, but we weren't too old to suffer the way older people had too. So we had had enough confidence to feel we were going to make it anyway. Uh, whatever happened, we could do it ourselves. And so I used to get jobs, and I used to uh, get a quarter an hour. I took a blind lady for a walk after school, and that babysat. And if, and of course, if you had five dollars at that time, you could go and buy your first prom day dress uh, on Pratt Street take the trolley down. And uh, so I, we, we knew we would survive. Where did you go to college after that? After uh, uh, Connecticut College for Women in New London. It was for only for women at that time. And I got a scholarship there too. And uh, li that was a long story about how I helped, got myself through college. What was your fundamental motivation in getting involved with uh, with the Democratic Party and with uh, a lot of these uh, progressive groups that that seem to be uh, concerned with you know the average citizen? What is it that was it something in your environment or something that you? What... My mother was a very staunch Republican, and. Uh, and she somehow thought that all Democrats were saloon keepers. <laughs> and also, and they were all, uh, what else? But anyway. Well, you actually parted, obviously you parted ways with her thinking. Yes. What, what, how did, why? Uh, well, by that time I'd gone to college and I decided that on my own. And uh, I was taking courses and learning about what was happening politically. And I was probably more interested in, in history and what was happening than, and that's why I, I well, I did at that time major in German, which seems very odd because I was not really a linguist. But uh, anyway, I got very involved in understanding what was happening in Europe. And at one time thought, if I didn't get married, I'd like to be a foreign correspondent. That was my aim. But you don't, in those days, women didn't do both. You had to make a choice. And I was very much in love by that time. So I chose marriage over that. But I was very interested in history. Well, you said you were majoring in German. Did you, did you go to Germany? And between my sophomore and junior year, <clears throat> which was in 1938, I did get a scholarship for the summer session of the University of Heidelberg. And so I spent the summer of 38. And 1938, you actually spent the summer in Heidelberg. 
Well, in Germany. In Germany. Yeah. Yes. Well, what was that? Uh, did you? Did oh, that you, was uh, very formative in my th my life and my thinking. Did you? Did you? Um, tell us about Joseph Goebbels. Did you meet him? <laughs> do you know anything about? Yes, I did. Well, uh, well I have written a book uh, just recently of the about that summer. It's mainly made up of my diary that I kept that summer. And uh, what ha I, part of the scholarship was room and, room and breakfast at a, some place, and it turned out to be a jan the janitor's family from the university. And he was a Nazi, a member of the Nazi fam, farm party. And so uh, I got to, he, he knew oh, in the middle of the summer that uh, Goebbels was coming through Heidelberg to start, a, to open up a drama session at the castle, the ruins of the castle. And so, because the father of the family knew he was coming, the 18-year-old girl said, come on, Mims, let's go and watch him go by. Just as he was to come by, well, by the way, she'd been flirting with the SS man and uh, who was taking care of the crowds. They weren't a huge number. But the train came by and his car had to stop. So she said to the SS man she'd been flirting with, here's a, an Amerikansky, how about letting her go and see the open car of Goebbels? So what could you do? You went and, the, and I shook hands with Goebbels at that time, much to my dismay. I was very, I didn't write home about this because I wasn't sure how frightened my parents would be. Well, he was Hitler's propaganda minister, yes. wasn't he? Yeah. What was your impression face to face with him? Was he, he, he looked was like he... a cold fish, uh, but he, then he smiled. He looked a little more human, and I do write about this, yes. Yeah. And what about you? You met some Nazi officers? I danced war. with some. You danced with some Nazi officers? <laughs> yes, I did. At, at a home that, at the last 10 days, I, uh, almost the last 10 days I was in, in Germany, I had by this time bicycled after the summer session down through the Black Forest and across southern Bavaria at two where to, uh, uh, I had a letter of introduction to a family that was, the uh, father was the, uh, was, was a, an officer, a general, who had retired early. Now the retirement, but he still had to pretend that he was uh, not an enemy of the Nazi party. And so he uh, had, they had a dance. The first night I got there, I knocked on the door and the uh, woman uh, came to the door. She was a countess and she said, when did you last have a bath? That was how she, she greeted me at the door. I'd been traveling, staying at youth hostels along the way, and I said I'd had a shower quite recently. But anyway, they were having a dance that night. They needed another woman, young woman. I was 20. So they had me stay and lent me a dress uh, and... Uh, so we had a dance that night with these young Nazis uh, officers who were stationed in Munich. Were they polite and gener gentle? Oh, yeah. Were they 
friendly? And oh, yeah, because they had no reason not to be. Did any of them, did any of them share with you their no, any they personal did. thoughts about, uh, you know, Nazism and Hitler and... Oh, no. Doing? Oh, no, but it was, a, it was a social occasion, and we didn't get into politics. However, the family I lived with there who put on the show were very much I discovered later, but also since when I was there, that they were not Nazis. Well, what were they? Oh, they were upper class. He was a general who had retired early because, although he didn't let this known at the time, he, he didn't want to salute the Heil Hitler instead of, uh, of declaring himself uh, to the, uh, the German uh, the society, the German country, which had happened before when he was first a general. He pledged his allegiance to the country, as most soldiers do, but he wasn't going to pledge his allegiance to Hitler. Given, given what you saw, the atmosphere, what was in the air, yeah. this whole wave of Nazism. The uniforms, the speeches that you heard on the radio. The uniforms. Yeah. The, yeah, the, and all, all the, the whole political yeah. and social atmosphere. Did you feel apprehensive? Did you, how did you feel about that? Uh. Did you sense something was wrong? Oh, yes. Uh, I could, I, is this going. <laughs> um, I, when I landed in, the, the trip over was 12 days. You know, there were no planes in those days. It was always a ship. And I was on a ship called the St. Louis, which the next year was famous for trying to save Jews and 900 Jews that it tried to save, and we didn't let them in. Cuba didn't let them in, and they turned around. It's a famous ship. I just happened to be on it the year before. Got to know some of the officers who were, uh, I was happy to see later on, understand that they were the nice guys. I thought they were. But anyway, I got to the Hamburg, everybody in uniform, from girls, boys. It was very militaristic, uh, but, uh, and, and I got to talk to a soldier on the way down from Hamburg to Heidelberg on the way on the train. And uh, so I, uh, and and then uh, when uh, but I realized me, even on shipboard when I first started my diary that I would leave things out that I thought might get somebody in trouble because I knew uh, I in my history course I'd had at college I knew what had happened and how Hitler had gotten the power that he did. And so that opened up to me the uh, understanding of what was going on to begin with. And then I did uh, have several episodes that I don't write about in my diary, but remember and have added to in my book. At what point did you get some sort of a an inkling that there were something was going to happen to the Jews, that the Jews were going to be... Well, the, we already knew that. You already knew that. Well, because he was in from 33 by the... This is 38. He had already... And we knew it, too, and I write about this. We knew what he had... The, the decrees that no Jews should be in the universities. I saw signs on, on windows saying boycott this or 
uh, no Jews and uh, loud here. It was very obvious and already. You were, there for, you were there when they had crystal knock? No, that came, that's the, the storm that comes. I was there at the lull before crystal knock, which was in November, and I had left in September. Well, let me ask you. But uh, another, another episode, for instance, all along the way, I had these episodes. I was standing, I was uh, uh, bicycling uh, toward the family I told you about. And uh, I was eating lunch beside, by myself on a wall. And a policeman came by on his motorbike. And he said, Heil Hitler to me. And I said, Guten Tag, which is good day. Well, he went a little way on and then turned around and came back to talk to me because I had not said Heil Hitler. And, but I pretended I didn't know that. And it didn't take him long to realize that I was not a German. I was an American and I told him why I was there. And so he said, oh, fine, and goodbye. Uh, but I realized that was one example of my realizing I was smart not to have written what I completely saw in my diary for fear somebody would read it. And things like that happened. The Germans used the term National Socialism. A lot of people get confused because they think that the term National Socialism implies that Germany was a socialistic yes. country as opposed to fascism. Yes. What, 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 uh, what does the National Socialism, what does that mean? Well, he, part of the thing that's, that he promised was to labor. And he, which is also interesting to me. And what did he promise to labor? Well, he did a lot of things. And you see, before him, there was a big move on labor people. But one of the, he, prom, he, he did a lot for labor. Uh, he took the, he organized uh, a, a, something called Kraft der Freude, KDF. There were associations of workers and he took them all over Germany. They all, uh, they, he get, took them on vacations. They, went around Germany, uh, they uh, uh, got to know Germany well to make them feel nationalistic. And uh, it was, and of course then he took them into, he built up his military by, and backed of course, uh, Franco in the Spanish Civil War and uh, I met on one of my climbs, I met the, uh, a fellow who was on a, a, a flyer who was on re rest and rec recreation from fighting a, a bombing for Franco in the Spanish Civil War. So I write about that too. So all those things were somewhat similar, and particularly the uh, anti-press and, and what he did about abolishing the, any newspaper that was against him. Well, you said that he was, he, he, he wasn't, uh, was not careful about telling the truth. And it was, I mean, it was obvious to you and I would assume to a lot of other people in Germany that he was uh, he was not honest. He didn't tell the truth. But why is it that so many people seem to ignore that? I mean, here, like you say, in the parallel between uh, between 30, 1938 and today, that 
why why do why does so many people seem to ignore some of these? Well, I'll tell you what I'm thinking today, but I wasn't thinking at that time. Uh, I think when the difference between the poor and the rich gets so wide that that's what happens. People are realize that something's out of kilter and uh, they look for ways out and they think that this is the way out of that kind and the people with all the money get all more money that's what the companies were expecting to and did and do in this country like somebody said a, a hungry man listens with his stomach yeah so, uh, well, but unfortunately, the people that some of the people I met, I'm sure, died in the war. And they, I had, yes, I don't know what became of, the, of mon, many of them, but I do know what became of some of them. But I don't know what became of the Nazi family I lived with, for instance. The 15-year-old son, I suspect, was killed in war. I never heard. I tried getting in touch with them and couldn't do that. And when we went back once, years later, uh, I couldn't even find where I lived. Wow. Things had changed. But, but Heidelberg was not bombed. So the summer goes by, you're back in the good old USA, 1940, um, Washington, D.C. Uh, you were at the American Youth Congress rally. Yes, yes. You come back to the United States from Germany, and yeah. you're, you, uh, how did you get involved with the uh, American Youth well, Congress rally? Well, uh, we, a couple of us went to something at Wesleyan from New London. I was a senior by this year, by this time. And uh, the, we discovered that some of the Wesleyan boys were going to something called the Youth Congress. And uh, so we came back and we heard about it. And part of it was a, uh, uh, well, Many of us got through college because of a New Deal program on uh, money for jobs in colleges. And I was a beneficiary of that. Uh, I got a job at the library that was paid t from the New Deal program to the college that then f paid me. And that program uh, then helped me get through college. They were going to rescind that program. We wanted to keep it going. And so that was one of the issues. And this uh, rally, uh, or it was a three-day, four-day program in Washington. So we went down. Uh, uh, the president pulled out some money and gave it to us, and we uh, found a, a, a ride down, and it was the first time uh, I was a minority on a bus heading down, and we got to the Mason-Dixon line. It was the first time I'd ever been over the Mason-Dixon line. And well, uh, that was a very important issue for me to re discover the people I went on the bus with couldn't find a place to stay in Washington. Mrs. Roosevelt opened up her house and persuaded other people, uh, wives of the cabinet members, to open up their house to people who couldn't find a place to stay. Well, that was only the first serving 
of what I hope you're thinking the same thing as I do, uh, a fascinating account, uh, one person's account of history in the making. We'll continue this interview in September with MIMS. And um, we want to thank you and uh, I hope that you're enjoying this fascinating story. Next time we'll pick up with, um, with uh, MIMS's visit to the White House. And uh, we'll please tell everybody to check out YouTube and uh, let us know what you think of the show. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.